Good morning, everybody. Um, hope you're all doing good. Um, I've my hard drive is full, so I've been transferring things over to my external drive, and I came across an old video that we did back on Good Friday of 2015 that I forgot to upload, and it's actually part two to our um, Jehovah's Witnesses, which Passover uh, tradition will you follow? And um, it also discusses Judas, you know, and several questions about Judas. And uh, so I apologize, and what I'll do is I'll put the link to the original, you know, part one down below in the description. And uh, technically this is part two. And um, we just offer a few things just to think about, you know, we don't know for sure one way or the other you know, how this was all supposed to play out. But just a few questions or just a few things just to think about, Judas. So you all have a great day and enjoy. Hello, we're back. Part two. <laughs> part da. Yeah. Just to reiterate a point from part one, I'd like to draw everybody's attention to John 1931. Because we had mentioned that this particular Sabbath was special. And John actually says that. Now it was the day of preparation. And the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want to leave the bodies on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. Well, obviously the breaking of the legs would have hastened the, uh, the criminal's death. And by the time they came... To Christ, he was already dead. But I want to read the footnote on this because this is why there's a little bit of confusion in you know the world of religion. Was it the Passover or was it the day of preparation? Just what was it? So let's just let's just read the footnote. It says the day of preparation was normally Friday, the day the people the people prepared for the Sabbath. Here the meaning is Friday of Passover week. Special Sabbath refers to the Sabbath that fell at Passover time. So Sabbath and the Passover was going to be the same night. So the footnote goes on and says the Passover meal had to be eaten on Thursday evening. The day of preparation was Friday and the Sabbath came on Saturday. And then it says, see the Last Supper and the Passover on page 1116 of the Archaeological Bible. And that was the archaeological references that we referred to in part one. So in all reality, whether it was the Passover being celebrated or Christ truly reinstituting, uh, not reinstituting, but instituting the Lord's evening meal, it was clearly on Thursday night, not the Friday night. Yeah, and when they say the Passover meal, they're actually referring to the Last Supper. Right, exactly. But what I want to do is I want to dispel in this part here something that Watchtower does in a way to mislead its followers. And that has to do with Judas Iscariot being at the Last Supper of Christ. So... Before we do that, um, I want to read Luke 1, 1. Because as a doctor, Luke thoroughly investigated the things that he wrote about. So Luke 1, 1. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Just as they were handed down to us by those from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account. Now keep in mind that word, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Now Luke, when he writes here, he says, I have investigated, carefully investigated, so that he can write an orderly account. 
Well, if he talked to eyewitnesses, he probably talked to the apostles themselves. Uh, well, there again, when you look at the book of Acts, Peter was still very much alive when Luke was seeing these things and had, you know, access to Peter, who was at the Lord's evening meal, the Last Supper with Christ. But before we read this account, let's read what Watchtower has to yeah. write about this. Okay, so this is in the Insight Book, Volume 2, under Judas, and the subheading, Last Night with Jesus. And um, it says, Immediately Judas left the group. A comparison of Matthew 26, 20-29 with John 13, 21-30 indicates that he departed before Jesus instituted the celebration of the Lord's evening meal. Luke's presentation of this incident evidently is not in strict chronological order. For Judas had definitely left by the time Christ commended the group for having stuck with him. That would not fit Judas, nor would he have been taken into the covenant for a kingdom. See, and we just read Luke 1.1 1, 1, where Luke said, I have carefully investigated this and put it in an orderly account. So, you want to say something? Well, I'm just going to say, you know, they say that the scriptures are divinely inspired, but yet you've got a discrepancy <laughs> here. So, is Luke telling the truth? Because I don't remember any of the other gospel writers saying that they did a thorough research and, you know, chronological or, you know, an orderly account. So, we have a problem here, Jehovah's Witnesses. So, oh, actually, we don't. You do. <laughs> Watchtower, what they print in the inside book, just makes a liar out of Luke. Think about, think about that. So is he a liar or is he divinely inspired? Which is it? See, if you accept the fact that Luke's account is divinely inspired, then Watchtower is a liar. Watchtower lies. Or if it's not divinely inspired, then why do you pull anything out of the book of Luke and use it in your door-to-door -door work? See, you can't do it that. You can't do that. You can't have a book like Luke that's divinely inspired of God, and yet Watchtower says, oh, under divine inspiration, Luke evidently got it wrong. Now, what are we referring to specifically with this specific challenge? Go to Luke chapter 22. And we will start at verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So clearly, Christ has established the pattern of what was to be the Lord's uh, evening meal, the Last Supper. Um, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant. Now remember, Judas, according to the inside book, was not part of that covenant arrangement. So, this cup, now these are Christ's words. This cup is the new covenant in my, in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. Meaning he was there. Meaning Judas was there. Now just follow this along for just a moment. The Son of Man will go as it has been declared, but woe to that man who betrays him. Okay? Now just keep in mind, Christ said the blessing. This is this cup represents the new covenant. So they all took a drink, 
because the prayer was said, this is what the cup means, drink it. So each one of the disciples was passed. So you can just imagine that for the moment, as each disciple took their sip of the new covenant, the blood, a little bit of time passed. I'm sure there was silence. And as soon as that cup was done being passed, verse 23, they began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. Do you get the point, Jehovah's Witnesses? Luke's account, who thoroughly investigated this, and who put it in order, in an orderly fashion, clearly puts Judas Iscariot being part of that covenant arrangement. Now, we have They to, were even arguing who was going to do it. So was, at this point, they didn't know who it was yet. They didn't yet. know who it was. But why is this of any significance? The Jehovah's Witness would probably ask, well, this doesn't mean anything. Well, you have to realize that what took place with Judas Iscariot is in fulfillment of Psalm 41 9. Now you can take your New World Translation, go to this scripture in Luke 22 21, and look at the cross reference scripture. It'll take you to Psalm 41 9. It says, Even my closest friend whom I trusted, he who shared my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. So, for Watchtower to say that Luke got this wrong, they are denying the fact that the betrayer of Christ had to share the bread in fulfillment of Psalm 41.9. So, just something to think about. So, who's got it wrong? Luke, who is plainly showing the chronological order, or Watchtower, when they were trying to say that Judas was not part of the covenant arrangement. Now, we all know that history shows that one of the worst things that a person could do is be a betrayer. I mean, in this country alone, during the um, Revolutionary War, Benedict Arnold betrayed his country. And we don't ever remember the good things that Benedict Arnold did that benefited this country. We all remember him as a betrayer. A traitor. A traitor. Exactly. He, tra he was a betrayer. And when Christ said, Woe to that man through whom this is going to come, History will always remember Judas as a betrayer. Never a person who fulfilled Scripture, but one who betrayed Christ. Okay, there's one more Scripture that I wanted to share. Okay, the Scripture I want to refer, refer to is John 13, and we'll start at verse 25. Now remember, he had just passed the cup for the new covenant. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So really, who's the one responsible for betraying? The demon possessed? Judas Iscariot? Because it says Satan entered into him. Now what that specifically means, I'm not going to sit here and try to philosophically um, <laughs> figure it out, but you know, we, we do know that in a court of law, especially here in the United States, um, some people can get off because of mental, what do they call it? Um, insanity. Insanity. <laughs> so did Judas go insane when Satan entered into him and he betrayed Jesus? I'm not going to be here to answer that question. We're not going to judge him either. No, we're not going to judge Judas because quite honestly, when we read that scripture in Psalms, 
what Judas did was in fulfillment of Scripture, but yet he's not remembered as the disciple who was willing to fulfill Scripture. Well, it, that Scripture in Psalm, it even says, my closest friend. Well, there again, that brings up another Scripture, Matthew twenty six fifty. Okay, let's look at verse 47 first. Matthew 26, 47. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Friend, do what you have come for. Friend? Friend? So even Christ knew that Judas had betrayed him, and yet Christ still lovingly called him friend. Interesting, isn't it? But see, we will always remember Judas, as I said earlier, as the betrayer, not the fulfiller of Scripture. And yet, even the 30 pieces of silver that Judas betrayed Christ for fulfilled Scripture. Now, it's interesting to note that when it comes to the Apostle Peter, we all know from Watchtower language that Peter was the impetuous one. We all know that Peter said and did a lot of things that, you know, up until his very death, his crucif crucifixion on an upside down cross, you know, Peter spoke and did a lot of things that really didn't make him a special <laughs> apostle. <laughs> and what I'm referring to is, is this very thing. At one point in the scriptures, the Apostle Paul had to publicly chastise Peter because he was a hypocrite. Remember? When Peter was with the Jews, Peter became a Jew. When he was with the Gentiles, he became a Gentile. History doesn't remember Peter as a hypocrite. History remembers Peter as the cornerstone of which the church was built upon. But yet, of the two, Peter and Judas, which two fulfilled more prophecy regarding Christ? It was Judas. Well, look at even Peter denied Christ, lied he knew about him three times. Yeah. So isn't that kind of a form of betraying? But history doesn't remember that. But yet when it comes to a betrayer like Benedict Arnold, history won't remember the good things that Benedict Arnold just like history doesn't remember that in fulfillment of prophecy somebody had to betray Christ and yet at the very end Christ still called him friend at Matthew 26 50 so how you choose to view Judas is your own personal decision all I know from what we've showed here is that the Watchtown Bible Tract Society has gone to a great length to write Judas Iscariot out of that covenant arrangement, which June, who, uh, not Jude, uh, I'm thinking of Judas and Luke at the same point, where Luke very painstakingly took the time and the effort to put things in chronological order. And we know that, you know, there is human imperfection that gets in the way because there was the apostles there, and we know from even what police officers say that every witness that, that witnesses a crime or an accident or something, you get all these different stories. You'll get a different story from every single one. Right. So... So the real issue at hand when it comes to Judas Iscariot for Jehovah's Witnesses, either Watchtower, by what they wrote in the um, Insight book, calls Luke a liar, or Luke did not write his account under divine 
inspiration. So again, how you choose to view Judas Iscariot. I, for one, my personal approach is that when I've read a lot of different things about how Judas played a very important role in fulfilling and or establishing the relationship that we have with Christ right now, um, Judas was very willing to bear something throughout history that some of the other disciples maybe weren't willing to bear. Peter said, if I have to die for you, I'll do it. But yet, Peter denied Christ that very night. So, just some things for Jehovah's Witnesses to think about when it comes to the Last Supper and the fact that Luke, very, in a very orderly fashion, puts Judas Iscariot, Iscariot at the Last Supper and even being part of the covenant arrangement, a covenant that we all benefit today. Yeah. So we hope you all have a good weekend and, and happy Easter. Yes, happy Easter. And we're going to grab some lunch and then I think we've got some more videos to do. Yeah. Bye.